Welcome to Beg to Differ, the Bulwark's weekly roundtable discussion featuring civil conversation across the political spectrum, from center left to center right. I'm Mona Charon, syndicated columnist and policy editor at the Bulwark, and I'm joined by our regulars, Bill Galston of the Brookings Institution and the Wall Street Journal, and Linda Chavez of the Niskanen Center. Uh, Damon Linker is off this week, but Will Salatin of Slate has kindly agreed to sit in for him. And our special guest is writer and historian Ron Radosh. Welcome, one and all. Um, there's a lot of news this week, a lot that we will not be able to get to because it uh, happened right before we began to podcast, and we kind of like to know what we're talking about. So maybe next week we can get to um, some of the other matters like the Supreme Court decisions that came down um, just today. But, um, but I'd like to begin by um, asking Ron Radosh to talk with us about a piece that he did in the New Republic a while back with uh, Saul Stern. Um, and it concerns someone whose influence on Trump world um, is underappreciated, but uh, his name is David Horowitz. Um, so Ron, tell us why people who are interested in where American politics is in 2021 should know a little bit about David Horowitz and well, how you know him. Yes, there are two reasons why you should know him if you don't. I might mention also that uh, in his morning note, uh, Charlie Sykes wrote about him also. Uh, the uh, One has to know him because way before Trump and before Trump announced uh, for his candidacy in 2016, David advocated exactly the strategy of the extreme right today, of the Trumpists and all their allies. Essentially, he's been saying for years, uh, the Republican Party doesn't fight and isn't down and dirty like the Democrats. Uh, and therefore, what we are raising, he's not for politics or civil discussion, uh, even though he says he is, uh, or a political compromise of any kind. Polit politics to him is total war, and the only thing you do in a war is to destroy your enemy and leave him no place to exist. He is in a fight against what he calls the left, the communists, and the socialists. Uh, he often says that Democrats, the current Democratic Party, is communist. And then in one uh, uh, column, shortly uh, a week or two ago, he said the Democratic Party is fascist. So he switched to calling them now communist or fascist. But for years, he's been advocating the kind of no-holds-barred strategy the Republican Party advocates today. And of course, he approves of everything they do. The second reason was his great influence uh, during the Trump administration. He was the mentor uh, to, uh, now his name slipped on mine, uh, Stephen oh, wow. Stephen Miller. Yeah, he was his mentor. Mm -hmm. He groomed him from the age of high school up. He had him on his show. He went to his school, I think it was Duke University, to uh, have to uh, speak at his conservative club. And he groomed him in the style that he had developed. And he also got him his job, his first job, uh, I think first he was with the, uh, what's her name, the extreme woman congressman who's no longer in the Congress. She oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, and then his first job, uh, real job, was to be on Jeff Sessions' staff while he was a senator handling immigration policy. And, of course, when Trump won and Stephen Miller went into the White House, uh, Miller left working for Sessions and became a behind the scenes, but chief advisor to Trump on anything, but especially on the hard, nasty, vicious immigration policy, particularly child separation, which he advocated uh, himself. And the other thing that's striking, and this was pointed out by uh, Laura Guerrero, I don't know if, uh, who wrote a book, uh, Hate, well, it's hateful, I think. Yeah, a biography of Miller. Well, yes, yeah, biography of Miller, but throughout the book, uh, she talks about David Horowitz 
And she took it all, all the parts about David Horowitz and put them together for a long political column. Uh, people can reference that. And what she found is that David was in constant contact with Miller. Miller would say to him during the campaign, we're dealing with this issue. What should the, pre the president, uh, the would-be president, the president uh, candidate for president, then Donald Trump say in a speech? So David would type out an answer and tell him what he suggests. And the next day, Trump would give a speech using David's words because Miller put them in what he was writing for Trump. Mm -hmm. And that's happened more than a few times. Uh, so in that sense, he was influencing Trump through Miller. Mm -hmm. And when Trump was in the White House, I think David was in constant contact with Miller as well as with other people in the White House uh, he was close to. So behind the scenes, David played a major role. He also groomed other future leaders of the, today's young right, the most important being Charlie Kirk, the young right winger who formed his own massive group and has a great influence today. He has publicly said, in fact, at David's events, that he thanks David Horowitz for being where he is today and for grooming him and uh, sponsoring and backing him in the organization he was trying to create. So he is... Okay. Ron, let's let's go back um, and talk about how you met David Horowitz, why you've known him for so many years. You and he met at a young communist group, yes, right? Yes, 60, over 60 years ago. <laughs> Ms. Stern, I knew him over 50 years ago. Uh, I met David when I was in a communist youth group as a high school student in New York City. And David assumed the role, or so he said, of being youth editor of the communist daily newspaper, The Daily Worker. And he toured all the chapters of this youth group, and I was in one of the Manhattan ones, coming before them to recruit writers for a purported youth page that was going to be in The Daily Worker. That never materialized. In fact, uh, ironically, I think I was the only one of all those he spoke to that ever wrote took him up and wrote a column for them. Uh, you won't find it if you go through their archives. Okay. I didn't sign my name, okay. uh, but I did write one. Um, but he, so you obviously fell away from uh, your early co communism. Right. Long, um, long um, when, when did that happen? Just well, I posed when the invasion of Hungary took place, okay. uh, that British correspondent for the communist newspaper told the truth, said it was a genuine rebellion of the Hungarian people. And I oppose all the uh, all the things uh, that the communist party was saying. And then, uh, you know, it just multiplied from them. Okay. But David had a slightly different path. Right. He um, supposedly left his communist and radical sympathies behind. He had been an editor at Ramparts magazine and on and on. But uh, supposedly sometime in the very late 70s, 19, around 1980, he and Peter Collier, they decide, they uh, announced that they were no longer leftists and that they were now conservatives or neoconservatives or something. Well, they, they um, announced it in the Washington Post column. And what's okay. most interesting, they disagreed with liberal foreign policy, but they, they put in a parenthesis saying we don't agree with Reagan on domestic policy. Okay, fine. But the fact is, as you point out in your piece, when you trace this man's history and activism, even since his supposed conversion, he never stopped being a radical. He just became a radical on the other side, right? Exactly. I think so. And he hates anyone who says that. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's clear when he was in the new left, he started out relatively sane. He wrote a book called Student. And then the more he got involved, he discovered the Black Panthers and was one, perhaps their only chief and chief white advisor who met with Huey Newton many, many times and raised a lot of money for him, thousands of dollars as well. Uh, so he began mild, and then he ended up radical, picking the most extreme group he could find on the left. Yeah. And then when he announced after the Washington Post article, he created something that actually was quite good called the Second Thoughts Conference. It was ecumenical. It was a conference mm -hmm. of people who had been on the left 
and reevaluated certain things uh, that they no longer agreed with. But he had at these conferences a diverse group of speakers. I mean, mm-hmm. one of the conferences, the one called Second Thoughts on Race, the liberal Washington Post columnist Richard Cohen spoke, and I read the text of his speech. They've all been published. He attacked conservatives and Republicans very strongly. Uh, so he let anyone speak, no matter how much they disagreed with mm-hmm. conservatives or da- what David was thinking. So it was a very broad conference. I remember seeing... Uh, and that, but that didn't last long. No. And then he, he became... So you mentioned that he became uh, also a mentor to... You mentioned Charlie Kirk, Chris Ruddy... Um, who is the head of uh, Newsmax, right? Television. Right. Sebastian Gorka, Jeff Sessions, Louis Gohmert, who has the right. distinction, some people say, of being the dumbest member of Congress. Yes, Louis um, Gohmert is always at every <laughs> single one of his events. Okay. And I, In fact, I went to a party once, the same party at which Steve Bannon told me he was a Leninist. Yeah. Gomert was there and came up to speak to me. He's, he doesn't miss anything. If David's ever in D.C., you'll see uh, Gomert with him. Yeah. Ted Cruz and Mike Pence. Right. Uh, what's the connection to Mike Pence? Uh, that I'm not, I don't okay. know, except that all the people, if you look in the list of what he calls his annual restoration weekends at the Breakers in Miami in uh, West Palm Beach, uh, he has... If you if there's a Trumpist, a Trump supporter uh, that you know of, that person is speaking at the conference and no one else but Trump speakers. Uh, He doesn't have anyone who opposes or has a different point of view, except, of course, Alan Dershowitz, uh, which is sui generis. Alan Dershowitz uh, says he's a liberal Democrat, but everything he does uh, is in support of Trump. So he says, well, I. I'm still ecumenical. I have Dershowitz, which is right. Really cool. Besides, <laughs> well, and every- and some of the things you quoted him as saying in this piece are, you know, just so reminiscent of what we now hear from pretty much, you know, uh, mains what you would have to say are mainstream conservatives in the sense that they serve in Congress, they're running for president, they are uh, high-ranking officials. Here's here's one sample. Um, we must begin every confrontation by punching progressives in the mouth. That's that's the spirit of the GOP today. I'm sorry yes. to say, uh, Nikki Haley uh, appearing just recently at a at a event in Iowa, obviously testing the waters, said, "I wear high heels." She said, "Not as a fashion statement, but to kick our opponents." You know? <laughs> Uh, I don't know why people would try to kick with high heels, but anyway, th- you, you see where where the spirit of the of the movement is at the moment, yeah. and that's very Horowitzian. That's right. It's exactly Horowitz's perspective. Yeah. And when, the, by the way, he said in a tweet, you can find these things. I think they're all on his Twitter account if you know how to go back in Twitter. He called the uh, January sixth protesters as it was going on patriots and heroes. Yep. Yeah. And he said in print many times since then that, uh, you know, there was no insurrection. Uh, these were just patriots uh, trying to make their point that they, the election shouldn't have been stolen, which, of course, right. he thoroughly believed. Of course. Yeah. Right. All right. Well, thank you so much for filling well, us you. in on that, Ron. That's really very, very interesting for those who want to do the uh, sort of autopsy someday of uh of, of what happened to our democracy. Uh, unfortunately, um, Horowitz played a key, a key role. Um, okay. So let us, unless anybody else has uh, anything they want to ask or add on this topic, I'd like to turn Linda. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just going to briefly mention that I think one of the things that uh, makes David Horowitz so effective is he is a really good writer. And he has written uh, several best-selling books. And unlike the Louis Gohmerts and many of the other people in Trump's world, uh, David has a formidable uh, intellect. And I think that is what makes him even more dangerous. Yeah, but the latest, the political books he's been doing recently are all cut-and-paste jobs. They're all in his columns. and he put, They're not the kind of books you were talking about. He was indeed a great writer. He wrote a series of personal books on life and the meaning of life and death and so forth. 
uh, those are very moving. And of course, his memoir uh, that he published years ago, that was a brilliant memoir. Uh, and scores of people said that, including many liberals. You can disagree with certain things, but it's well worth reading and beautifully written. So was that Radical it, Son? Was that yes, the Radical yes. Son? Yeah, that was a brilliant, brilliant book, and not at all like the current David, but that was much earlier. Yeah, that was in the brief moment between radicalisms. Right. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, well, um, today we have. Um, well, we learned yesterday, and uh, and the. Uh, Court action is today where the um, Trump organization and uh, their CFO, I guess, um, Alan Weisselberg, have been indicted in New York. Um, so I'm going to start with you, Will Salatin, and thanks so much for being here. Um, what do you make of this? Is this um, the kind of thing, you know, like there's been so much uh, panting after this kind of thing in the media. You know, there's a lot of press attention and they say, is this the thing that's going to bring down Donald Trump? And then you look at the indictment. I don't know. Well, we haven't actually seen the, all the charges yet. But what do you think? Is this a big deal or not a big deal? So the charges here are uh, not necessarily the key to taking down Donald Trump but they're the key to getting the key to taking down Donald Trump. Because the person being charged here, Alan Weisselberg, is the chief financial officer for the Trump organization. So he knows all the secrets. He is the keeper of the secrets to, as Corey Lewandowski has said, every dime that went out uh, from Donald Trump to anybody. So the government wants to get him in a position where he has to give information that can be used to get Donald Trump, right? And, you know, I know that the, the Trump people, their argument is this is a political prosecution. And it is aimed at Donald Trump, but it is based on the assumption that Donald Trump being the corrupt person he is, there will be financial crimes, and there's already some evidence of them that can be proved in court. So they want Weisselberg to testify to that. And to get that, they are charging him with other things, with um, the acceptance of, you know, in of fringe benefits, not just fringe, but very expensive stuff like private school tuition that he did not pay taxes on. So the long range game here from the government is to get Weisselberg to provide evidence for a larger case against Trump, which is that Donald Trump systematically undervalued assets when he was paying taxes, and then he overvalued the same assets when he was applying for loans, and that the lie between the two of those will get him rung up on charges. Linda, um, do you um, do you think there's a problem with um, searching for crimes in Trump's in Trump world and putting pressure on Weisselberg and uh, attempting to squeeze him, as the prosecutors clearly are, um, because people in Washington don't think that Trump was an honest guy? Well, I think there's always a problem when the government uh, goes in search of crimes when it doesn't have actual evidence of crimes. Having said that, um, I am assuming that uh, given the fact the prosecutors in New York, but the state and the city now have access to Donald Trump's uh, voluminous tax filings, that they do have evidence um, that crimes were committed what they really want to uh, get Weisselberg to do is to say that he, Donald Trump, directed the people who did his taxes, namely Weisselberg and his other uh, accountants, uh, to put in figures that in fact were not borne out uh, by actual valuations. So, you know, I, I, I think... It's not quite a fishing expedition. I think they've caught uh, some, you know, mid-sized fish, and they're hoping to use those mid-sized fish to be able to use them as bait to, uh, to catch the big uh, kahuna, as it were. And I think um, I think that if if the charges we see filed today, and as of the our, our recording, we have not yet seen those filings, if they only have to do with not um, properly accounting for such things as providing free condominium, providing car leases, providing private school tuition for children, grandchildren, etc. If there's nothing more than that, 
that they have to charge uh, Weisselberg with. And if they do not have really substantive uh, evidence that the tax returns themselves and the uh, various filings with the city and state uh, having to do with what uh, properties were worth, uh, in some way conflicted with those that were presented to uh, the various banks when uh, it it's apparently was Trump's practice to inflate the value of property when he went for a loan and deflate the value of that very same property uh, when he uh, had to pay taxes on it. They've got to have some pretty substantial evidence that there are problems in, uh, in those areas and to be able to point to actual evidence of, of uh, the paper returns and filings showing that. And then the next step is to get Weisselberg in a room and to get Weisselberg to say, I filled out the forms that way because I was directed to do so by Donald Trump. I think if they aren't able to do that, it's going to be very hard, and I think Trump is going to use this to his advantage and just claim, you know, more witch hunt, more persecution. And unfortunately, there are going to be a substantial number of people who are going to believe him. Bill Galston, um, I've gone back and forth on the matter of whether it's a good idea to prosecute Trump or not. Um, you know, I, I worry, I used to worry a little bit about um, the precedent of prosecuting former presidents, that uh, that's a little a bit of the flavor of a banana republic. But I have come, I think, to a different view now where I think the, the damage to the rule of law is greater if there is a sense that the president cannot be indicted or prosecuted when he's serving because he's the president. And then he cannot be indicted or prosecuted after he's the president because he's the former president. And there you have perfect impunity. And since Trump was willing to do so much that was so bad, um, it, it looks like we need to rein in that sense of impunity uh, and, and reassert the rule of law. Um, but I have to say, this feels like it is a little bit of small beer compared to some of the things that he could be prosecuted for. For example, um, seditious conspiracy. Um, the attempt to um, use force to prevent, hinder, or delay the execution of any law of the United States. Well, wasn't that what happened on January 6th? Uh, it, it certainly was. Uh, and then, then, of course, the question would be to demonstrate the necessary legal nexus between what Donald Trump said or did or did not say, did not do, on the one hand, and the actions of people who claim to be defending the legitimacy of his presidency on the other. Uh, and I recall having looked into this a little bit uh, when the issue arose, demonstrating that nexus would not be easy. And mm. the chances, of, the, the chances of, of failing in the prosecution are not small. Yeah. Um, so this is this is the kind of calculation that prosecutors have to go through all the time. But this time, uh, the stakes are very much higher than they usually are, and prosecutorial discretion uh, very much more important than usual. I will I will say this, Mona. I you know I can keep this short because I I agree I believe with everything that uh, Will and Linda said. And I also share your ambivalence. Uh, my overwhelming objective, uh, pr speaking personally, is to ensure that Donald Trump never occupies the White House again. And I'm prepared to adopt a very instrumental view <laughs> of everything else. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, my, my fear is that if a lot of people come to share the view that this is, as you put it, small beer, you know, technical, uh, the sort of thing that most people would never be brought up on charges about, uh, then that could lend credibility to uh, Trump's assertion that he's being so, uh, singled out for political purposes. And I have to say, all of the quotations that I've read in the past 24 hours from prosecutors are pretty unanimous in saying uh, that 
prosecution for this sort of crime is extremely rare, particularly at this level. Now, maybe it shouldn't be so rare. Uh, mm-hmm. I could easily make make the case that uh, in-kind income is income. Uh, and, uh, you know, and this is one of the modes of tax evasion that the rich are especially good at. Uh, so, you know, from that standpoint, it wouldn't be terrible to set a precedent, but this is not just a former president of the United States. This is a potentially a future president of the United States. And that's what worries me about all this. Right, right. Um, I agree. Um, Ron, uh, so there, among, the, um, among the foreign leaders who have been sentenced to or who have actually served in prison, we, we recently, just this week, we hear that Jacob Zuma of South uh, Africa has uh, has been sentenced to 15 months. We had Silvio Berlusconi of Italy, who uh, was convicted of tax fraud, and he was sentenced to uh, some time in prison, but it was commuted to community service. Um, Taiwanese president was sentenced to 20 months. Ehud Olmert in Israel was sentenced to some something like a year in jail or more. Several South Korean leaders, Jacques Chirac and Nicolas Sarkozy, both um, have been convicted of crimes. You know, it, it does seem that other democracies are able to hold their leaders accountable in this way um, without destroying their democracies. What do you say? Uh, <clears throat> yes, that's true. But uh, I don't know if uh, when they went to prison, there was a big uproar in any of these countries. I know that there wasn't in Israel. Uh, when Omar went to prison. And now, of course, Bibi Netanyahu is in process of worrying about uh, his own chances of going to prison if he's found guilty since he has been indicted. Uh, That would upset, I'm I'm sure it would upset many Israelis who liked the fact that when he was in office for so many years, he kept the peace and they would go along with anything he did because they felt safer with him. Uh, In South Africa, one of the great ironies of the end of apartheid is that the main vehicle of black liberation in South Africa, the African National Congress, was extremely corrupt. And when they came into power, except for Mandela in the period when he was president, the successors all were more interested in raking in money uh, and making themselves wealthy than in producing a good, sound government that would help the poor uh, in their own country. Uh, There are many poor. There are still people living in the famous uh, uh, little huts uh, in uh, Cape Town and the old uh, Pretoria district. So I think people there aren't as upset that the leader of South Africa went to uh, prison, but that uh he's uh he was just uh you know they're more upset with the corruption in the ranks of those they used to support uh that's what upsets them yeah so I, i'm just going to come back to you will for one more uh point which is that um look there's it's inevitable we know it's already happening that uh the trump Trump himself and his his entourage are going to say that this is selective prosecution, that it's completely political, um, and it seems to and and they're and they're going to undermine further further confidence in the justice system as being fair and impartial, uh, just as they've undermined confidence in our elections and they've undermined confidence in the press and in uh, science and you name it, right, and so. When you consider that that's what's going to happen, that that's the inevitable result of any prosecution of Trump or tr- any you know Trump entity, it just seems to me that if you're going to run that risk, you better make sure it's a big thing that you're going after. And these little piddly tax violations, I'm sorry. I mean, there may be a lot of money involved. I don't know. But it just it just doesn't seem like it carries the heft uh, to be worth the risk. 
So I'm less concerned about the magnitude of the charges here because I think this is all a procedural step and people aren't going to focus on this at this point. It's much more important that what kind of information they get from Weisselberg. Do they get information from him that, as Linda says, can nail down a connection f directly from Donald Trump ordering uh, actions that are uh, you know, serious crimes? Um, but but what I am very concerned about, apropos of your point, Mona, is that we get our facts right, right? Everybody has to get their facts right. When the New York City Board of Elections screws up reporting election results, that is instantly used, has instantly been used by Donald Trump and his supporters to say we shouldn't trust election results. If if there's a prosecution and the prosecution doesn't have its facts right, um, then again, that's going to be used to undermine faith in facts and the idea that everything is partisan. And therefore, you should disregard prosecutions of Trump, uh, elections in which he loses and so forth. Um, so as long as the government has information that, with, that it is confident in. So, for example, in the case of Weisselberg, do they already know? that they already have evidence of certain crimes and what they just need is that last piece of Weisselberg nailing down that Trump directly ordered it. If they have that and they are able to back up the charges, then I think they will be able to withstand this, you know, subjectivism uh, and, and polarization that the Trump people want to use whenever they're accused. Okay. Um, let us turn now to, um, the, uh, fallout from the uh, decision that the Republican resistance to having a bipartisan commission to uh, investigate the events of January 6th. So it was announced this week that there is going to be a select committee of the Congress um, that will be investigating this. And what do you know, Linda? Uh, first thing out of the box, um, Kevin McCarthy says that any Republican who serves on this committee uh, may have their committee assignments stripped away. Yes, and of course, he had one particular Republican in mind, and that was Liz Cheney. Uh, Nancy Pelosi um, has asked Liz Cheney to be on this commission. Apparently, Liz Cheney has agreed to. She's made it very clear that she believes that what happened on uh, January 6 was a direct assault on democracy and that Congress has an absolute obligation to get to the bottom of how this happened uh, and what role uh, the President of the United States at the time, Donald Trump, had uh, in fomenting uh, this seditious act. So good for Liz Cheney. Uh, she has uh, really, in my view, she is a true conservative, a conservative that believes in the Constitution and the primacy of the Constitution and the rule of law. And I'm glad that she's going to be on this commission. Unfortunately, um, I think because of the way uh, this has come to pass and the Republicans are largely responsible for it, um, there, this is going to be viewed as a very partisan undertaking. And whether any other Republicans come along, if they stand uh, to lose their c committee memberships uh, on other committees, if, if Kevin McCarthy is going to uh, revoke their committee memberships, um, then, you know, others may not join them. And by the way, I mean, this is all all the more appalling when you realize that um, You've got Marjorie Taylor Greene, you've got uh, Congressman Getz from Florida. Both of them, uh, many people think, ought to have had their uh, committee assignments uh, stripped, and, and Greens were eventually stripped, but not by the Republicans, but by the vote of the House. Uh, and, you know, to suggest that simply sitting on a commission that's supposed to objectively get to the bottom of the attack on the very institution in which these members sit uh, is somehow high treason and therefore they can't serve on committees. I, I think it's gonna strike most people as over the top and, and who knows, I, this may be really good fodder uh, for the Democrats in the 2022 election. Everybody seems to think that 2022 is going to be big losses for the, the Democrats and I've even been one who's raised that, but uh, they are going so far and so radical uh, that issues like this may come to play. And I think uh, Kevin McCarthy has really uh, overplayed his hand. 
Well, and um, another member of the Republican caucus, Paul Gosar, um, is openly teaming up with uh, neo-Nazis and having fundraisers held by neo- neo-Nazis. Uh, and he hasn't been threatened with having any of his committee assignments uh, stripped away. Uh, far less uh, has he been thrown out of the caucus. So that's where Kevin McCarthy is. Actually, uh, I'm coming to you now. Um, I'm coming to you now, Bill Galston. Here's what uh, my colleague Amanda Carpenter outlined in the bulwark this week about Kevin McCarthy. So just bear in mind, he supported Ken Paxton's bogus lawsuit challenging the election results in several states. He voted twice against certifying the election. He refused to impeach the president for his conduct. He opposed the creation of a bipartisan commission. He booted Liz Cheney from leadership for telling the truth. He opposed the idea of a committee to investigate the events of January 6th. As we just mentioned, he's threatening to uh, strip committee assignments from those who do cooperate. And then he says, well, it's very partisan. (laughs) Your comments. (laughs) What am I I supposed to say? I'm shocked, shocked to discover (laughs) the House. This this could be the next Speaker of the House, Bill. Believe me, I believe (sighs) I I understand, and you know what am I supposed to say? I mean, he he has made a strategic decision uh, to use the full force of the enthusiasm that the base of the Republican Party has for Mr. Trump and all of his works and ways as the fuel uh, that will you know that will propel him into the speakership. Uh, It's cynical. It's indefensible. Uh, I would like to believe that somewhere he knows that he's doing something that's wrong and indefensible. I'm not sure I can make a case to myself that that is true. Uh, And now let let me add a consideration that I wouldn't have added before I did some research. Uh, An obvious parallel to what's going on right now is the Benghazi Select Committee. Uh, And it's easy to forget uh, that the Benghazi committee was responsible for uncovering the unsecured emails that arguably were the single biggest factor in Hillary Clinton's defeat. Uh, and And that strengthens the proposition that however it's perceived, uh, the fact that this committee will have subpoena power uh, means that all sorts of things that haven't come to light up to now may well come to light. Uh, and I somehow don't think that the stuff that we don't know right now will redound to the credit of Donald Trump if and when it becomes public. So once again, thinking very instrumentally about the consequences of prosecutions and other political actions, I have to believe uh, that this is net, not good news for former President Trump's hopes of becoming future President Trump. Well, that's a really good point and interesting. I mean, you know, there's a, there's a, faction, and unfortunately, it's a very large one in the Republican Party that is a bit impervious to reality and to facts. Um, but that's not all. And, um, and there's a good, you know, minority within the Republican Party that uh, is is not down with all of this. Uh, and also there are independents. So, um, so yeah, it's, it is possible that it will have an effect. Um, um, Ron, yeah. I just want to... Um, I just want to re- refresh your recollection um, about Mitch McConnell. Uh, Mitch McConnell, I just, I just cannot get over this. Um, Mitch McConnell's speech after he voted not to convict President Trump uh, in the second impeachment gave a talk, a, a speech that was an absolute echo of everything that the impeachment managers had just spent several days proving. Right? Exactly. He said. American citizens, and this is McConnell speaking, American citizens attack their own government. They use terrorism to try to stop a specific piece of democratic business they did not like. 
Fellow Americans beat and bloodied our own police. They stormed the Senate floor. They tried to hunt down the Speaker of the House. They built a gallows and chanted about murdering the vice president. They did this because they had been fed wild falsehoods by the most powerful man on earth because he was angry he'd lost an election. Now, just in the last week or so, we've learned that uh, that Bill Barr, in his final days, was in constant communication um, with Mitch McConnell, and that McConnell and Barr were discussing who should be the one to say the truth. This was back in December. Who should be the one to publicly state the truth about the election lie? Um, and McConnell said, well, I can't do it. Why could he not do it? Well, he felt like he needed President Trump to go down and campaign in Georgia so that he would have a shot at holding his majority. So it was party above country, party above all, power above all. He knew the truth. He was able to say it after the impeachment vote. He knew exactly this was an attack on our democracy, and yet he couldn't or wouldn't refuse to um tell the truth uh, when when it might have uh, affected his power and uh, and his party's dominance. Yeah, he told the truth very temporarily in that one great speech and then forgot about it as soon as politics came into play. I mean, his hypocrisy holds no bounds. Uh, <clears throat> look at the Supreme Court. Uh, Merrick Garland, they wouldn't hold hearings for him because it was in a period of a, an election. Now he's publicly said, if the Republicans take the House uh, and the Republicans have the House and the Senate, he will not countenance holding hearings on any Democratic nominee that pre President Biden might put forward if uh, someone resigns from the court. Uh, nothing is more hypocritical than that, but they don't care. It's keeping the Republicans in power, showing their strength, using any tactic whatsoever, uh, to stay where they are. And of course, he wants to remain the majority leader in the Senate. So uh, he's not going to listen to his own advice given in the throw of January 6th. Temporarily, people should throw that in his, that fine speech in his face all the time uh, and remind people of what he said. And he should be asked uh, what happened. Why did yeah. you change so quickly? Yeah, oh, exactly. And by the way, uh, the one other thing I forgot to mention is that when the matter of whether there was going to be a bipartisan 9-11 style commission appointed to look into the events of January 6th, not only did McConnell oppose it, but he personally called every Republican senator and said, as a personal favor to him, please vote against it. So he, he used all of his authority to block it. Uh, it's almost as if they have something to hide. <laughs> all right. Um, uh, let sorry, us... Mona, can I just, I didn't get on this topic. So let, let me just say one thing. Oh, you didn't. Oh, no, Will, no, no. I'm so sorry. No, no that's Please okay. That's okay. Jump let right me just... in. I'm glad you did. Sure. Jump in. Uh, so what we're, while we're talking about McConnell, I just wanted to say one thing about Kevin McCarthy, who uh, held a briefing this week on Thursday and was asked about um, his various efforts to obstruct the January 6th commission. And a reporter during this press conference, a reporter asked McCarthy, did he regret blocking the proposal for an independent bipartisan commission? Because the result will be that he'll get a more politicized select committee instead. And he said no. And what struck me was the question completely misconceives what McCarthy's strategy is here. McCarthy is not trying to get a more fair process. His whole, <laughs> the whole Republican game here from the beginning has been to make this more partisan. And any attempt to make it a fair process, as basically Nancy Pelosi was trying to do in various forms of compromise, is going to be undermined and rejected, as the Republicans did filibustering it in the Senate, so that, I mean, they want a partisan, they want to keep Republicans off the committee. They want to make it as partisan democratic as it can be so that they can tell the public or actually specifically their voters to ignore it. So exactly. it's not a, it's not a strategy based on getting to the truth. It's a strategy based on telling their own base to ignore the truth. Yep. Well said. All right. Let us now turn to our highlights or lowlights of the week. Start with you, Linda. 
Well, I know we didn't have time to talk about the Supreme Court decisions that were handed down today, but I do want to draw attention to an article that I think does a, a really good job of explaining the voting rights case that was um, handed down today. And it's actually on National Review Online. It's uh, entitled Justice Alito's Majority Opinion in Bronovich versus the DNC. And it's by Ed Whelan. I will say, and I should have full disclosure here, that uh, the organization which I founded and still chair, the Center for Equal Opportunity, was an amicus uh, in this case. And we came down on the winning side. You're going to hear a whole lot this week about how this decision absolutely gutted Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act and that now the Voting Rights Act has been made toothless. Uh, I want to assure you that it's not correct. Uh, It did, in fact, uh, take a more narrow view of a standard in voting decisions, whether or not you have to prove intentional discrimination or if you are alleging that a particular act has a discriminatory effect, even if it was facially neutral, what the judges, uh, justices uh, decided in the majority was that you have to have really good evidence that that's the case. You can't have just a small disparity in turnout or a small disparity uh, in the way this affected different uh, groups of voters. It's got to be real. Uh, And it's the totality totality uh, of uh, the the law that uh, has to be considered. So I, you know, I actually think it was a good decision. It was handed down six to three. It isn't the end of the Voting Rights Act. Um, and for lots of reasons having to do with uh, disparate impact theory, I think um, it's on balance a good decision. Okay. Thank you. Ron Radosh. Yes. I am reading all the comments of different sorts on the issue of critical race theory, which is going to become a major issue in all Republican campaigns. They hope to win back the white suburban women who deserted the Republicans and voted for Biden because they want to put a fear into mothers, especially, that their children are going to be indoctrinated in the public schools. And therefore, they throw out critical race theory all the time. I think the Democrats are playing with fire in saying and responding by saying it's all false. And it isn't false. Ironically, it's only going to affect. uh, I I just noticed that the woman who wrote White Fragility has a new book called How the Progressives Are Racist. Uh, (laughs) And it's going to backfire on them tremendously, uh, this so-called anti-racism crowd. I mean, I love the stuff John McWhorter writes. He's a sane voice from the black community, a rare figure who uh, says what he thinks and thinks carefully about all the issues. And, uh, you know, I read George Will's column uh, was frightening about this one school, but I believe it was a private school, a private religious school. It was. They were engaging in this. Public schools, I don't think it's happening. Uh it's the elites. I mean, the high school I went to, which was a very left-wing school uh, in New York City, announced last year that all the classes would be segregated, that blacks would be taught separately because they can't be in classes with whites. It's whites are the oppressors, and they're not going to learn. Uh, it created a huge swarm of parents threatening to pull out their kids, and they reversed it immediately. So the private schools is where we have to look for anyone trying to imp- implement what people call critical race theory. Okay, excellent. Um, by the way, I would just add that um, that Damon Linker had a really excellent piece about this in the week, uh, this past week, where he talked about the risk that uh, progressives are running by claiming uh, that because the right is criticizing um, critical race theory, probably in in bad faith in many instances, that doesn't mean that they have to like full throatedly defend everything that the critical race theorists say or their or their orbit, those in their orbit say, because there's a lot of nonsense out there, too. So uh, Damon was his uh, usual um, balanced and wise self. So I recommend that. Okay, Bill Galston. Uh, As I guess, uh, repeat listeners of this podcast know I'm something of a nut on the question of what can be learned from survey research that's relevant. Uh, 
to larger themes of American politics. The Pew Research Center just yesterday, I believe, came out with a major report on the 2020 election based on a large sample, about 10,000 validated voters, which removes a lot of the uncertainty uh, from the polling from, from the polling process, there are many, many interesting uh, facts unearthed in, in, in that survey. The one that caught my eye was that educated Hispanics, college-educated Hispanics, were much more likely to support Democrats than working-class Hispanics. And this raises the very interesting possibility that in the Hispanic community, as in the white community, education is becoming strongly correlated with voter preferences. Uh, and that there is something that might be called a working class consciousness that can cut across racial and ethnic lines. Uh, intriguingly, there was no evidence uh, that uh, educational attainment makes any difference whatsoever in the voting behavior of African Americans. Bottom line, I think it will turn out in the long eye of history uh, that African Americans have been and will remain a unique group in American society, uh, and that groups like Hispanics may very well over time go the way of other, other immigrant groups in merging into the broader society. Interesting. Uh, I, I um, don't know if this featured in the Pew research, but I know it, we have discussed it here on this podcast uh, several times, and it's worth remembering that um, African-American voters are not as progressive as educated whites. <laughs> um, they, uh, they, they don't, I mean, there's, a, there's a mistake, I think, that progressives make in thinking that they can speak for all African-Americans. And in fact, they're not as, they're not as, uh, as liberal as, as uh, many whites. So it's, it's just something. That's, that's absolutely true. On the other hand, regardless of educational attainment, 92% uh, of African Americans voted for Joe Biden. Uh, despite all of his bluster, Donald Trump did not improve on his 2016 performance among African Americans one whit. Right. But within the Democratic Party, when you start playing one faction off against another, African American voters are more moderate. Uh, in, in their choices. And arguably, they are responsible for Joe Biden being the nominee in, in and, 2020. Inarguably. <laughs> Not arguably. <laughs> they certainly were. Will Salatin. So my low light of the week is that this week, Donald Trump went to the Texas border to talk about border issues and immigration. And a whole bunch of House Republicans went with him to show that the party is still behind Donald Trump. And he did a couple of events with the governor, uh, Greg Abbott. And uh, the whole the conceit, of course, of the Republicans is that they're not against immigration. They're not against immigrants. They're certainly not white nationalists. They're just against illegal immigrants. But during this briefing, Donald Trump says, while he's sitting next to Governor Abbott. Yeah, I agree. Quote, he's talking about Ilhan Omar, the Democratic congresswoman from Minnesota. He yeah, says, and just quote, don't look at it. Omar. How's she doing? <laughs> How's her country doing, by the way? Can you guys hear me? Oh, sorry. Okay. I just well, something went out. Okay. Quote, look at Omar. How's she doing? How's her country doing, by the way? And they're telling us how to run our country right now, unquote. So now just a, a little refresher on Ilhan Omar. She came to the United States as a child in 1995. She was naturalized as an American citizen in 2000. So it's more than two decades since she's been a citizen of, of this country. And she was elected to serve in Congress by her constituents, by her district. And yet the former president of the United States sits there and says that America is not her country and demand and, and suggests that she has no business telling the rest of us how we should run, quote, our country. And the governor of Texas yes. sits next to him and smiles and says nothing. And no Republican says anything. So all of which makes me, you know, seriously doubt the Republican claim that they are just against people who violate the law in coming to this country rather than being against immigrants in general. That this clod is the leader of the Republican Party is just 
a continuing misery and grief. All right. Thank you for that, Will. Um, I would like to um, draw attention to a piece by Glenn Lowry, um, named John McWhorter came up earlier. Uh, Glenn Lowry also is a really uh, thoughtful uh, black intellectual. He has a piece in Quillette, The Bias Narrative Versus the Development Narrative, Thinking About Persistent Racial Inequality in the United States. And uh, it's, it's very careful. It's the, the product of decades of, of uh, thinking about these matters uh, by Glenn Lowry, who's a professor at Brown University, and uh, highly recommended. And I will just add that in uh, the coming weeks, we're going to have podcasts uh, featuring the topic of uh, ranked choice voting or its close cousin, Final Five voting. Um, and we are going to be discussing further the matter of racial equity in this country with uh, Ted Johnson, um, who wrote a really interesting book. So much more to come on these and other topics. I want to thank Will Salton for joining us this week and Ron Radosh. And thank you all for listening. And we will be back next week as every week. 